Welcome to Hump Day Hangouts. This is episode number 481. Today is the, let's see, last day of January, 31st of January, 2024. We are already one month down in 2024 and moving forward. So we are here. If you've got some questions, go ahead, put them on the page, say hello, let us know you're there. Uh, we will be getting to that uh, shortly and hopping into the list of questions. But first, I uh, wanted to say hello to the guys. Uh, check out uh, Chris's shirt and uh, have a couple of quick announcements and then we'll get into it. So, uh, Chris, we'll start with you. How are you doing today? Doing good. Uh, super busy as usual. Um, yeah, weather is not that nice at the moment, so I'm using making the best out of it and Staying busy with this one here at the moment. Ah, nice shirt. Nice shirt. Yeah, I wore my sweatshirt earlier today, but I got a uh, some a stain on it, so I didn't want to wear it and have this like <laughs> blotch on there. So you slob. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was trying. So uh, I will say though, I've got this on my desk though. So I don't know. I think you guys have probably uh got yours, Chris. I can't recall if I shipped it to Austria or not. I apologize if I didn't. Nope. Uh, doesn't well, matter. <laughs> we've all got a bunch of coins but this one was from 2023 uh went with the plain uh we usually do like an enamel color on there but this year we went without it just to kind of set it apart so i like uh, that one yeah i, I like i really these. do i like that one better I, I like the color but this was cool i was like yeah i approved the design i was like oh it's kind of nice like we'll just keep it you know just the stamped metal um really heavy i love these you know it's kind of nice every once in a while to remind myself so just uh, thought I'd show that off. I'm very happy. Uh, I take a stamped gold coin instead. Ooh, fancy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the next level, man. I don't know what this would be. That would be like, I'm just guessing, that would be like a $4,000 coin or something. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. Oh, man. All right. Well, Bradley, how are you doing today? Good. Happy to be here. Got lots of questions. Um, quite a few to get through, actually. So got a lot, a lot to get through today. We might as well jump on it. Cool. All right. Um, well, just wanted to say I will put the link in. Uh, Bradley did a webinar with uh, Jasper with uh, talking about the uh, uh, schema, schema AI. Yep. Yeah. And so we're going to pop the link into the replay. If you haven't checked that out, definitely uh, give that a watch. Uh, see if that's up your alley, something you're interested in, which you should at least be knowledgeable about for if you're here watching Hump Day Hangouts. Uh, and then you can make the choice if that's the, the right tool for you to be using or not. Um, other than that, I'm trying to think of some upcoming vetted. stuff. What's that? We got to mention vetted too. Oh uh, yeah, vetted guys. Just uh, I've got uh, a coupon code semantic. If anybody needs any SEO services, um, you know vetted is a marketplace. So vet vetted with three T's. V e t t t e d dot com. Vetted dot com. It's an SEO marketplace, and. Um, <clears throat> I'm on there, so you can buy semantic links there, but there's other services there that you can purchase as well. And uh, we have a coupon code semantic, which will give you 15 or excuse me, 5% off. 15 would have been better, but 5% is 5%. So if anybody needs needs it, use it. Feel free to use it on any service, not just mine. Uh, sorry, I got to go back one. Yes, go do it. Uh, use it. I just popped it in the chat. So whether you're watching live or the replay, uh, you got the link there. Um, but Cecilia wins the, I think, the use for the Pofu coin. Uh, she said she uses it as a card cover when playing <laughs> at the poker at the casino. So <laughs> very nice. nice. Oh, man. Um, let's see. Does the coupon come off of your profit margin? Hmm. No. No, actually, it, uh, we don't get anything for it, though, either. It's just we just have an agreement with the owner, the new owner of Vetted, just to help continue driving more traffic on the, the site. And, um, you know, it's like I said, it's been a really good addition for my my business. It's it goes up and down, but it's been a consistent, nice, a steady stream of additional revenue and exposure. And it not only gives exposure to my services, but also to, to Semantic Mastery. So uh, I think it, it it's in our best interest to have that kind of uh, mutual relationship where we we refer traffic to each other and i think that's you know that's why we're doing it so and not only as a partner of bradley's and semantic mastery but i have also ordered a gig uh through his vetted stuff so uh yeah go check it out and uh see if that's uh what you need good stuff yeah um let's see uh bradley any updates on uh dha before we get into it i just want to tell people go uh 
go join the mastermind, but uh, I'll put the link to the mastermind in. If you haven't uh, heard of the mastermind, you can find out about it at mastermind.semanticmastery.com. Um, but also you may want to join or you could join the DHA program when we launch. And that's another way to get into the mastermind. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the only updates I have is that we're going to, we're going to proceed with launching the kind of a light version of it, which is the first half of the the program, because I'm, my, I'm still testing and trying to dial in the offers, the fulfillment offers that the agencies will sell. Um, and that we're still working on that. And it's just, we've got the marketing and sales machine part of it built and we're in, in working really well. Um, as a matter of fact, we started cold emailing again for tree care HQ, which we haven't done in, in quite some time because we get inbound leads from my directory site ranking. So uh, now that we started cold emailing again, and, and I spent 10 weeks just testing email services and trying to figure out the best performing services for cold emailing. And um, it it turned out after weeks and weeks and weeks of testing that really the simplest and easiest thing to do is just use workspace accounts, Google workspace accounts. They inbox better. They warm up quicker. Um, as long as you have all your records in place, they, they work phenomenally well. And then don't use SMTP services. I found even running Google Workspace emails through uh, high level can cause them to stop inboxing or go to spam or promotions and all that. It's it's crazy. So th the solution is that we figured out like there's two apps that I'm I'm using for cold emailing now and it's outside of high level. So high levels are CRM. Uh, so once a, a, in a cold email sequence, when we get a positive reply, then that conversation gets moved in the high level. But we're using one of two different apps. Um, I'm using both because I had to produce training for both, but two different apps for the cold emailing um, campaigns, which one is called New Reply. That's one the one that I prefer. But then the other one's called Instantly. Many of you are probably aware of Instantly. So those are the two cold emailing apps that we're using, and they're working really, really well for getting uh, inbox and then getting replies and that kind of stuff. So anyway, long story short, the, the marketing and sales machine, picking an industry and building the marketing and sales machine is is that part's ready. Like we've got all that. I'm just kind of pulling the final components together for the training and all of that. Uh, so we're going to launch that side of it. The, the whole program is supposed to be six months. The first months is, is the first three months is building the marketing and sales, well, picking an industry and learning it. And, and also building the marketing and sales machine. Uh, and in the second three three months, so the second half of the program is supposed to be about nothing but marketing and sales and not fulfillment. Like the whole goal of this is to have us do your fulfillment for you for the services that your agency will run with. And initially, just so you can start to generate revenue. And once you get to a certain level of revenue, if you want to bring fulfillment in-house and add other services and all this additional complexity to your business, fine. You can do that. And we'll be happy to give you the SOPs for what we have available um, uh, at that time. But in the in the meantime, since we don't have the second half of this really dialed in yet, where we have consistent sales or with particular product or products, et cetera, um, we, we don't want to keep holding this off. So uh, we're going to start pulling together the pieces, the components for the first half and um, launch kind of that part of it sooner than later. And the good news is, is it won't be super expensive like it will be when we have the full program done. But, um, you know, it'll it, basically you can come join the mastermind now and start getting the SOPs that uh, I've, I've already released, which are a significant chunk of them. Or wait until we have the full kind of first half of the program ready to go, uh, which should be within the next month or so. So that's about it. Awesome. All right, well, let's uh, let's get into it. I'm going to grab the uh, link for the webinar uh, that was the other week. Uh, I'll paste that in. And in the meantime, yeah, we can just shift over to questions. Cecilia, you got an appointment book from the DHA stuff last night. That's awesome. That's really good, Cecilia. Congratulations. All right, guys, I'm going to grab the screen and we're going to get into these questions. We've got a lot. So my connection is good today. So I don't think we're going to have any issues with that. So we're going to start with Danny. Danny says, hey, Bradley, how would you recommend ranking a multi-location business? I'm guessing evenly distribute the links and signals to each one. Do you have a white label for this? Yes, we do. Um, if you, I mean, the way that my link building services, if, if you're talking about link building specifically, then yes. Um, uh, you, The way that we, I, I have things set up is if it's per location. So if it's a multi-location business, you can either subscribe for each location uh, whatever level is appropriate, or you can submit a multi-location project as a non-local project, and then we will build links and distribute links across all the various location pages 
uh, but we omit the maps components for that, if that makes sense, because it makes it it's it's too complex to try. The way that the entire my my semantic link service was built was based on per location. So um, if you want, if you have a multi location project that you want managed under one subscription, then you have to submit it as a non local project, and then we will go in and extract all the local pages. Uh, location pages, et cetera, and put them in as target URLs. And then we'll start building links and we'll build uh, branded assets. They won't be local assets. They'll be assets for the brand itself. And then, uh, so we'll do tier two link building to all of that, but we omit the specific local part of it because again, the way that we do everything is based on location. So we can do multi-location businesses either on a per location basis or as a non-local project where we focus more on the organic side of things, but then you can always purchase one-off gigs for the local stuff um, that you would, that we would typically do anyways. And we can direct you on that and give you a little bit of guidance on that, but that if that's like geographic links or batch, you know, uh, branded entity assets for each location, et cetera. So um, as far as I'm guessing, evenly distribute the links and signals to each one, now, not necessarily because you know, and I talk about this in our, my audits, um, link distribution, it's it's normal for the homepage to have most of the backlinks and it's 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 really appropriate for that. So uh, I see in some cases people with multi-location projects where they overdo link building to location pages that so so location pages have more links than their homepage. That's not really the appropriate way to do it. I mean, quantity isn't like the be all end all, but, um, you know, I try not to do link building where it's going to raise a red flag where clearly if you look at it, you can see that, you know, it, it's being manipulated. Um, so the homepage should have more links than anything. And so when there's a multi-location project and you are intending on building links to the location pages, which makes sense, what I recommend is for every one link you build to a location page, you build one or two links to the homepage. If that makes sense. That way you're always keeping a, a kind of heavier distribution on the homepage. And if you have your internal linking done and everything, you're, the structure of your site, so the architecture or structure of your site and internal linking and all of that, then hitting the homepage is going to power up your location pages anyway, and probably service pages, et cetera. So it, it makes sense to do that. Um, but you know, when I say evenly distribute, it, again, not necessarily. The way that we teach, and we're going to talk about this today, and hopefully we'll have time, uh, there's some question I saw about uh, how I do competitive link analysis for local SEO. Well, I've done full training on that. There's an over hour long video on our YouTube channel, guys, that you can go view. And there's the workbook on uh, their first comment in that video about how to do local um, comp competitive link intelligence, right? Or competitive link analysis for local SEO. And there's a workbook that we're, the same workbook that we use for all of my, all my own local SEO clients, as well as my white label clients and all of that. Um, there's a, a very detailed training on that, but we're going to go into that a little bit today because there were some additional questions about that right here in today's list of questions. So uh, when we get to that part, I'll cover, I'll, Danny, just I'll, I'll cover that a little bit further as well, what I'm talking about. We do everything on a case by case basis. So if you've got multiple locations, what you should do is look at the primary search query that you want to rank for uh, for each location and then analyze the top ranked competitors backlink profile based upon that training. Our method, which is what I've been using now for over two years, about close to two and a half years, and it works really well because you're using the top ranked competitors backlink profile information to determine what you should be doing in order to be competitive and that for that search query in that area. Because again, there's no one size fits all. And that's why I'm saying it doesn't make sense to distribute links evenly across location pages. What you should do if you've got multiple locations is do a analysis for each local search query for each location that you want to rank for and analyze the backlink profile. You can just do it with the primary one. What is the broadest term that is relevant with a commercial type uh, or uh, you know, commercial or transactional type search query, right? Just use that type of a search query, analyze the top five ranked competitors for uh, for each location. And, and, and then you'll have the data that you'll need um, to be able to base your decisions, to make good decisions on what types of links you need, quantity, relevance, et cetera. Hope anchor text ratios, all of that. That's exactly what that workbook is for. We base all of our link building decisions on that data. Hopefully that's clear. So um, but yes, again, it, it, Danny, if I think it's the Danny that I think it is, which I'm, there's plenty of Danny, so it might not be the one that I think it is. But uh, if you're already in the Semantic Links dashboard, schedule a 15 minute call with me if you need to. And uh, we can chat about it so I can make 
proper recommendations. Joshua's up. He says, I've been using a subdomain on Weebly as a money site and targeting a very competitive financial keyword. It's one page of content. I've built citations, branded web twos, et cetera, and 12 high quality PBNs and sent GSA and SAPE to all tier ones and also GSA and SAPE to HTTP, which does a 301 HT to the HTTPS version of the Weebly subdomain. It's a month and a half in and I was ranking pretty well, but then I noticed a huge drop in rankings. I know it's early, but what do you think? Just wait it out since it's a newer site or page. By the way, I've been doing SEO for over 10 years and I've done this exact method before and ranked page one for a mesothelioma lawyer in the past using this method. Method I filter to ignore porn, gambling, pharma, et cetera, and GSA and used generic anchor text. Um, there's really no way for me to answer that, Joshua. I'm sorry, but first of all, I don't do bulk spam at all. So, you know, I, so I, I can't I can't speak intelligently about using bulk spam for achieving ranking results anymore because I don't I haven't done any bulk spam stuff in damn near two years, and that's that's the truth. I just I don't do it. I I focus on relevant links, either topical or geographic relevance, or both if possible. And that's it. And I, I do that intentionally because it requires significantly less links. Um, they, they, the links that we place are permanent or semi-permanent, meaning they might have to be renewed once per year. But they're, uh, and that's just because of domains if they're custom rebuilds. I know there was a question about that later today too. Um, so I, I can't really talk on that. But you know, I mean, I, I have some assumptions, but again, they would be just that very broad assumptions because I don't have enough data on this. Like I know you're saying that you're spamming the subdomain and all that. Look, it's Weebly. Weebly should be able to take it. So th there's no question about that, but I, I don't know what your linking structures are. I don't know. You say that you're using mostly generic anchor text in my opinion like that. I don't know. Again, I don't do bulk spam. So I don't know what kind of um, anchor text thresholds and stuff you should be doing with bulk spam because I don't do that. Like we don't build Generic anchor text at semantic links or, or miscellaneous anchors is how we label them. We don't build those. We also don't build URL anchors. Um, and it, there's, it's intentional because like, I think anchor text should be descriptive of what it is linking to. And so we don't do generic anchors or miscellaneous anchors. A natural looking link profile is going to have that from like, especially for local, because if you have business directory listings, usually it's going to say website is the anchor text from the directories, et cetera. So there's going to be an, a natural looking link profile, generics or miscellaneous anchors anyway. Um, so again, we don't build those intentionally because I think anchor text should be descriptive of what is linking to. I don't like URL anchors for that reason. So uh, what, you, you know, you say that you've done all this with GSA and you're all using ge generic anchors and all that. And that, I mean, that sounds good, but if I was going to be spamming a web 2.0, I would be spamming it with being a hell of a lot more aggressive with keyword anchors, just to be clear. Um, and again, I don't know whether that would work or not now, two years ago when I was still doing a lot of spamming for like Barnacle SEO or Parasite SEO, so Web 2.0s and things like that, which I don't do a lot of that now because we we still build all those kind of assets, but we build semantic links to them, not which are, are the, what I call topical or geographically relevant links. Um, so again, like when I was spamming though, I, about you know over two years ago now, uh, I would just like hammer it with keywords. I would take... Like for example, I and I've taught about this and per, shared shared this method many times, but the uh, patch classified announcement posts—they're all no-follow links, but they're very much like press releases. Um, and you can you publish them on patch.com, right? So you find the most local patch subdomain uh, or neighborhood or whatever they call it, and then you publish a, a classified announcement post. And you could hit that with—I was using this fiber gig, uh, which was like it was sixty thousand blog comments, um, so straight up spam, blog comment spam. And I would order that, and I would hit the patch classified. And I did this for like three years. Every time I did it for three years, the same gig, I would rank that press release or patch classified announcement post. Uh, it never took more than six weeks to rank, but usually within the first four weeks, it would rank from just this one. It was the same process every single time just publish this post with this particular format and then just hit it with this one gig from Fiverr and it costs 20 bucks because you get the add on or whatever. And so it was like $22 and 50 cents with the fees and everything else. And within 30, 30 to 45 days, that son of a bitch would rank every time for, for uh, the kinds of, you know, tree service stuff mainly. Um, but anyway, uh, I, the, when I would submit the anchor text for the, the link gig for the blog comment spam gig, uh, it would be straight up, you know, keywords, like it would be a mix of target and topic anchors. 
What do I mean? Well, target anchor is keyword plus location modifier. So that can be keyword plus city or city plus keyword or keyword plus near me or one of the variants of near me. Uh, so nearby in my area, around me, et cetera. Um, and then top, target, excuse me, topic anchors are keyword only. So I would just do, and then I would mix some branded anchors in there too for, because the classified announcement post would be promoting a brand. So we would also mix brand anchors into there too. And that's it. So no generics, no miscellaneous, no URL anchors, just straight up keywords, either target, topic, or brand, a mix of those three. And um, and every single time it would rank, but that was over two years ago. So was that still effective? I have no idea. I haven't even tested it in two years. Or it's I, I've probably done it a couple of times in the last two years, but none, none in the last year for sure. So, um, so Dasha, I'm sorry I can't answer your question there, man, but it's just, it, this is a, uh, look, Weeblies and subdomains and all of that, uh, like those web 2.0 properties are, we absolutely use those in all of our projects, full stop, all of my semantic links clients. So white label clients, we build those branded assets out. Um, it's part of a subscription-based service because it's effective. And then we build semantic links to those. So I completely understand using that method. Um, and I also understand spamming with bulk spam, but I just don't do it. So I can't really answer that question, Josh. And to be honest, like I, there, there's so many variables there that I don't have much experience with now, currently, recent experience. Um, and there's also a lot of other variables there. So I can't really give you a good answer. So unfortunately, I'm um, sorry, that was a long winded way to say I can't help you, but I just can't. <laughs> it's one of the things where everything that I would say would be pure bullshit because I don't really have any experience with it. So I prefer not to uh, do that. John says, I got the GB checklist. Thanks. I'm really interested in the link building sections, but it's a little overwhelming. Can you go through those sections so I can make sure I'm doing things right or using them the right way? Okay, so this was the question that came up that I was talking about regarding the training. And guys, again, if you just go to our YouTube channel and you search for um, you know, competitive link analysis or something like that, or link analysis for local SEO, any one of those kind of very, very uh search phrases, it'll come up on our channel. Okay. Then you can watch it. It's like an hour and eight minutes long. But it it in the first comment and also in the description, if you go to it'll it, in the description, it points you to go opt in for the GM uh, Google Business Checklist. But you can go to the first comment and click and go straight to the uh, make a copy of this workbook here. This is the competitive link analysis workbook that we use. And so there's a template there that you can access uh, through that lesson. And I go into great detail as to how to use it. But one thing you want to do is in, in, download and install SEO tools for Excel. So that's a plugin for Excel. Yes, there are a lot of paid tools for this. And that's what we're looking at here. This ribbon up here is the SEO tools add-on, okay? Um, so there are things in here that you have to pay SEO tools for to have a license to use. But you can download it and, or, and install it into Excel uh, and not have to pay for anything if you're going to be using Majestic, which is how we use it, uh, for backlink analysis. And then you just have to have a paid Majestic account, which then you sign in. So again, like if I come over to, like, for example, and I'm just going to give you guys a quick uh, tutorial on this, but like if I come over here and, for example, I go to the location landing page, that is a sheet that we use just for analyzing the backlink profile of the money site or the location landing page, if that makes sense. So you can see that I have Majestic here. And if I click on Majestic and I click backlinks, because we only use it for backlink analysis, then I'm going to... Uh, and it. Let me log out and I'll show you what it looks like. Okay, so it's going to say log in like this. And then I'm just going to click log in and it's going to direct me to log into one of my Majestic accounts. I have more than one. So give me one second and I'm going to log into this one. 3858. Uh, <clears throat> Grant access. Then I can close this down and go back to this and now you'll see that it's got this kind of excel function over or excuse me this uh majestic function over here well again as what i what i shared in that training um if you click on load well the way that th there's settings in there that we i always use for backlink analysis and so i save that as a profile okay so that's target url backlinks and again the settings are all explained in that training video um, but I, I'm going to go ahead and click select. And now the, the settings that I've selected that I want are now already applied to this, um, you know, the sheet, so to speak. All right. So next thing I'm going to do is I would come up here and I would click clear to clear contents. 
And then I would take the URL that we're going to analyze and I would plug it into there, but we're going to do four versions of the URL. For, for most things, this is relevant and I'll explain what I mean. If we go over to like the tier one links or the money or to the project data sheet, wherever the, the money site URL is. So we'll take this one, for example. Let me open up, give me one second while I open up a clean notepad installation or notepad file, excuse me. Ship. I did not mean to do that. Let's try this again. All right. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to look at four versions of this URL, guys, because uh, if the if the page is if hosting and everything is configured properly, then there really should be four versions of the URL that all resolve to the same location, right? And that would be HTTP and HTTPS versions, and in with and without www. Okay, so as long as hosting is set up properly, and the reason why we have to do that is because if you just look at the backlink profile of point, uh, if you just put in one specific URL, it's only going to show you the backlinks pointing to that specific version of that URL, right? With the same protocol and whether it has W. So, so you're missing, you're only seeing part of the picture if you are not analyzing all four versions of a URL, if it's, uh, you know, the type of URL that would, people would link to multiple ways, right? So here's an example of that, right? There's four different versions of that URL that should all resolve to the same location. So we need to analyze all the backlinks to all four versions of that in order to get a true understanding of what the backlinks are. Because remember, the other versions of that URL should be just redirecting to whatever the most current version is. So if you're not looking at the backlinks pointing to those other versions of the URL, then you're not getting the full picture, okay? Hopefully that's clear. So I'm gonna put these backlinks in here and then we're gonna go back to that uh, sheet that we use to just analyze the location landing page. I'm going to put my highlight that first cell, and then I'm going to come down here and just click insert. And now what this has done is it's gone out and it's pulled in the backlinks that were built to that specific page. And what I've done is I've added the flag deleted and flag no follow, because what I always want to do is go to data sort, and then I'm going to sort by, and I know it's probably small on the screen guys. So let me cancel out for a minute and I'll zoom in just a little bit, but I'm going to go to data sort, and then I'm going to select flag deleted, largest to smallest, and I'm going to click OK, and I'm going to get rid of that URL. There's no sense in analyzing that backlink or including that in the backlink analysis if it's deleted. There is a thing called link echo that can produce an effect even after a link has been deleted. Uh, it can still produce, have an SEO benefit for as many as five months from what I understand has been recorded. I've experienced it for several months myself sometimes, but it's eventually the links, the link value is going to uh, disappear you know, for a deleted link. So we get rid of that. We, we remove that from the analysis, if that's clear. Um, the next thing that we do, and again, I could just shrink that down. We don't need to look at that. Um, the next thing I do is then go back to sort, and then I sort by flag no follow, largest to smallest, and we get rid of the no follow links. No follow links are still valuable for SEO guys. Don't think, let anybody tell you different. They absolutely are, but they don't affect anchor text ratio, so we eliminate that. And then what's left are these target URLs. And so the next thing that we, or excuse me, these uh, the, the, the remaining links after the filters have been applied, the next thing that I do is then I imply a, or insert a new um, column, excuse me, and I call this anchor type, okay? And then what we do is just, go down the line next to these anchor texts and uh, then I put in a number, a value. I like to highlight that column and then go to format cells and go to text or number and then remove the decimals on click OK. And that, I do I only do that because otherwise it gives you like this stupid message in, in Excel. So it's, it's annoying. Anyway, uh, then what we do is just sort by anchor text. And the reason we do that is so that it just puts like for like, uh, you know, similar anchor text together. So I'm just going to show this to you. Go to anchor text, click OK. And then here, all we do is because I, you know, I know the, the five different anchor text categories that we always use. The first one is brand slash URL. The sec second is miscellaneous. The third is empty slash frame. The fourth is target. The fifth is topic. So since I know that, my team and I just go through here and understand that that's keyword plus location modifier. So that's a target anchor. So that's a number four. This one is going to be a miscellaneous or because it's a, it's a whole bunch of stuff, right? This one is a URL anchor. So that's going to be brand slash URL. This one's brand slash URL, brand slash URL, brand slash URL. And in that case, that, that one looks like it's been truncated. So I'm actually going to make that a miscellaneous. And in this one, even though it's got, uh, actually, this is also a brand slash URL and brand slash URL, right? So now we've added the five or the link types there. And so if I were to come back over here and look at the next thing I would do is, uh, excuse me, click on data sort. And then now I'm going to sort by anchor type. 
Um, and it doesn't matter whether it's largest to smallest or small, smallest to largest, but we, we see we've got nine rows of data with a heading row. So we know there's eight backlinks pointing to this page right there. So we would then plug eight into that number because that's the location landing page that we just analyzed. And then we would go back to that sheet and we would look at the quantities of each. So we're going to have one target, two miscellaneous, right? So if I come back to this sheet, I would come over and, and click on this and click. We've got one target. We've got two miscellaneous, right? And then we'd come back and take a look at uh, how many brands slash URLs. And by the way, if you just highlight them and you look down at the bottom, you'll see it says count. I know it's probably very small in the uh, webinar, but it, if you just highlight the number of that particular anchor type, it'll give you the count down here. So it's five, right? And then you just go back and plug that data into this sheet. And then once you're done with that, I'm going to close that Majestic add-on or, or plug-in or whatever. And then it gives you the anchor text ratio of your target asset. And that's going back to the question that Danny asked earlier in today's Hump Day Hangout. He was asking, how do you build links for multi-location projects? Well, this is a multi-location project. This is a, an additional location. And you can see that that's what we do is we analyze the top ranked competitors. Now, in some cases, by the way, just so you know, like this keyword plus location modifier is very low competition. So it might make sense when we see data like this where it's very low. Comp By the way, you can also tell most of the time that these are uh, and which what are inner pages and which are inner uh, home pages based upon the quantity. In some cases, like, for example, you can see that some of these are inner pages with very few external links, because that's all we're analyzing here, guys, is external backlinks. But in some cases, there's some ranking here with basically uh, no external backlinks, even though it's a home page. OK. So the, the point that I'm trying to make here, though, guys, is we can see that the data is very low competition for this type of a local search query with that modifier, because maybe that particular location doesn't, you know, people don't search with the location modifier much, or maybe they, it's an adjacent city uh, or town or whatever to a, a bigger, larger city that is more that is more common for people to search keyword or tree service plus that city name, whatever the larger city is, right? So maybe that's the case. Well, when that's if if when you see that kind of data, in order to make a better, uh, um, a better kind of to have more better data to base your decisions on, let's put it that way. All right, here's the bright local local SERP checker. I like to use this a lot because then we can go search for the broad keyword, but we can geolocate so just tree service, but we can geolocate the browser for that location instead of doing a keyword plus location modifier search query which is typically going to be less competitive, we can get a better kind of understanding of what the true competition is for the broader, more general search query, but in a still in a local sense because we've geolocated the browser. Does that make sense? And now you'll see, because this is going to change the data. So if I if I put in Groveland MA for Groveland, Massachusetts, but I put in the search query as tree service and I check the search results, the data is likely going to be different than what than if we searched for that search query with the location modifier. So I'm going to block location ac access right now because I want this to simulate I'm searching from uh, uh, Groveland, Massachusetts, right? But so if we scroll down here, now let's take a look at this. If we scroll down, we're going to take a look, northerntree.groveland or Northern Tree dash groveland.com and we'll see well that and it might I'm, i could be wrong it might hold true that this is going to be the same kind of data but in many cases when you search for the broader term and remove the location modifier it changes the data so we're going to find out we've got northern tree groveland uh may mayortree.com which is down at number eight when it was a local search query and now it looks like it's maybe around number four or five so again the data can shift based on that Iron Tree Service is actually below, let's see, Northern Tree. Here's another one. That's Northern Tree. In this case, it's see see how the data shifted a bit? Actually, that might still be correct um, as far as the positioning. But all I'm saying is you might want to test with different search queries when you're analyzing the data. Sometimes the data is very limited when it's a ser uh, search query with a location modifier. So it might make sense to instead geolocate the browser and do a broader general keyword search uh, that without the location modifier, hopefully that's good, what I call a topic anchor. Uh, so, so that would be a topic type of keyword, okay? Uh, but anyways, you plug all that data in here and that gives you, you do the exact same process that I just described. And to answer the question about like, what are the different sheets for? The 
for the link the link analysis sheets, we just have a separate page for each one of these. It doesn't matter. You can do it all in one, right? These were just because that that way we would have separate pages for I uh, doing the link analysis for location landing page or the the, the money site, whatever the um, self hosted site pages that we're analyzing for a particular search query. Um, the ID page URL that what used to be the Google Business website sheet, but it's been updated to the ID page sheet. The Google Business Map, again, same thing. It's just for analyzing backlinks for that. And then competitors. We just used one sheet to always analyze competitor data. That's it. You can eliminate those and just put one sheet in there if you want. It doesn't matter. Um, uh, we just did that because it makes it easier for my report generator to kind of segment things. Hopefully that's clear. The last thing I want to talk about very quickly is on, I don't know if all this was uh, included in the template, but we have project data sheet where we keep track of like subscription information and brand and entity assets and things like that for clients. Um, but then we also, uh, you know, for, for the projects or uh, um, web 2.0 assets and brand and entities assets and things that we keep for the keyword sheet is where we keep track of the target URLs and anchor text that the client submits. But again, this might, you might want to have this sheet in your uh, uh, workbook for when you're doing competitive analysis, just so that you can keep track of, the target URLs and anchor text for each URL and all that kind of stuff as well. And then we do additional keyword uh, research to kind of try to under, um, pull in additional keywords that we can use for anchor text besides what the client submitted. And then we also have the uh, uh, the tier one link sheet, which is where we keep track of the links that we build. The tier two link sheet, again, these are tier two links that we build. So we keep track of those as well. And it, we just keep track, uh, the, the workbook is set up to keep very granular details about the anchor text uh, used the the source URL, the the topic of the site, the anchor text, the anchor text category. Because remember, one of five anchor text categories I've already described. Uh, the ID page URL, ID page anchor, ID page anchor type, and then like last but not least, the um, data for the Google Business Map as well. Which you'll see most of the time we do link, we do frame, uh, excuse me, iframes or embeds for the Google Map. But in some cases we will do an anchor text link. Usually we don't like that link. Besides a brand anchor to the CID map URL, we try not to link to that very often. But when we do an anchor text link instead of a map embed, you'll see most of the time it is going to be a maps, uh, a map share URL that we're linking to. That's clear. And last but not least, guys, I do want to keep one one thing or mention one thing again, and that is the vast majority of the times when we analyze local search queries like this, or even in the case you know where we drop the location modifier, um, like. I, I mean, I don't have the exact statistics on this, but I would, you know, we've, we we do this every single month for every single client and also for all sales calls. This is done for whatever the uh, prospect submits before they jump on a call with me. So I've literally looked at well over a, a thousand search queries, local search queries at this level, like this kind of data analysis. And what I see the vast majority of the times, I mean, again, I don't have the exact number on this, but I would say 90% of the time, and that's probably pretty damn accurate. The top five average anchor text ratio for the top ranked organic competitors for a particular local search query, no matter what the query, about 90% of the time, the, the uh, anchor text ratio is predominantly in the brand slash URL category. That's a good thing for us, guys, because as SEOs, whenever you're in doubt about what type of link to build or anchor text link to build back directly to the money site, just go with a damn brand anchor. Right, a brand anchor or a compound anchor, which is a brand plus keyword or brand plus location modifier or something like that, because it's the safest thing to do, and it's what the data shows me that Google rewards the most. Right, that is the the top ranked competitors' average anchor text ratio across well over a thousand local search queries that I've analyzed at this level, ninety percent of the time or greater. The, the average anchor text ratio of the top ranked competitors is going to be predominantly in the brand slash URL category. There are always outliers. There are always anomalies to that uh, or exceptions to that rule, so to speak. But the vast majority of the times it's this. So when in doubt, build a brand anchor. That's it, right? You can always build keyword anchor text links to the brand, the tier one link or tier one, the referring page URL that has their tier one link with a brand anchor. That makes sense. So you can push keyword relevance out at tier two. Um, and I'm not saying that you can't also build links directly to your site with keyword anchors, but look what the c competitors are doing to, to get the uh, data so that you can base decisions to be make appropriate, uh, you know, anchor text assignments, if that's clear. And that, so you can see that, you know, this one's still a little bit, 
it's not quite, uh, it, and that's fine. Remember, this is just an average. So you just want to try to get close within range from your money site. The other two assets you can be a lot more aggressive with if you'd like. The way that we're using ID pages hosted on Amazon S3 bucket, so we can be a hell of a lot more aggressive both with link velocity as well as with anchor text. Same thing with the Google map, although we don't like to build a lot of links directly to the CID map URL, which is what we're tracking in this pie chart here. Um, you can be a lot more aggressive with the Google map URL, certainly, than you can, uh, than you, um, excuse me, than you would uh, your money site. Hopefully that's clear. Anyway, good question. I hope that answered it. We're going to move on. Bruce says, hey, guys, with your topical link rebuilds, what step are you taking to avoid footprints? Do you only allow a single URL of a domain per site to not link to the same domain more than once? Well, Bruce, um, I think you misunderstand. A custom rebuild is a domain that we hunt down that has relevance or for it had former relevance because it's an expired domain uh, to what we're going to use it for. And it has a backlink profile in the appropriate topical trust flow or closely related topical trust flow category for what we're going to use the domain for. So it already has backlinks pointing to it in relevant categories. That's the whole point, right? Then we buy the domain and we publish a single page HTML website. That's what a rebuild, what I call a rebuild is a single page HTML website that's published onto that domain. So, the target URLs that are placed into that single post, because it's a single page site, that's it. There's We're not linking out from that domain again, right? A custom rebuild is exclusive link on that domain. So all the link equity and relevance is, is go, flowing through the external or target URLs that are placed into that single post. And that's it. So hopefully you understand there, there's no way to have footprints from uh, the same domain to multiple assets and uh, when from a rebuild, it's just it's it it because again we limit it to one money site target URL, one ID page URL, and one Google Map embed, and that's it. So there there's no way that we can do a footprint, uh, create a footprint from that because we're not then linking out from that at a later time to other assets again. So uh, hopefully you understand the the distinction. All right. Also, if buying off you, how do we go about doing it for country-specific domains where business registration is required? We can't. Um, so we hunt down topically relevant domains. It doesn't matter that we can where we can buy the extensions. So, for example, we can't buy Canadian domains. We can't buy New Zealand or Australian domains. Uh, so we have to go with .coms, .nets, .orgs, et cetera, the things that kind of top level top level domain extensions that we can register. So uh, again, we don't, we don't, we can't get .com.aus. We will hunt down back, uh, domains with topical relevance with the extensions that we can secure. And then we could build those on there for pushing topical relevance, for pushing links, uh, uh, local blogs. So building links with geographic relevance, we are very limited in our ability to do that for people outside of the US or UK, because we can, we can get .co.uk domains all day long. Okay. So um, in areas where that's why if you guys look at our, my local blog list, if you go to vetted or whatever, or in semantic links dashboard, and you take a look at the, I update that list about once every two weeks, uh, we're actually just under a thousand, 1100 local blogs. Now we, we passed a thousand, um, I don't know, two weeks ago. And we're just, maybe we're just under 1100 local blogs. It was 10,000 or 1,094 local blogs earlier today when I logged into my database app. And, um, I think we've got maybe 15 or 20 in the UK, maybe two or three in Australia, uh, and a, maybe a couple, of that, but we got dot coms for that somehow. Um, anyway, long story short, like I'd say 950 or actually probably 1,025 out of almost 1,100 blogs are in the US. And that's because we just can't get them anywhere else. Um, so it is what it is. But I'm building that network specifically for the DHA program because we're going to have all the local blog links we need to help clients rank their stuff. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, to answer your question, um, by the way, we, we do keep track of all the links placed for our clients across our blogs to get back to this question, which I think you were confusing rebuilds for. I, hopefully I clarified that, but we do keep track of where, which blogs we place links on for each brand or each location uh, so that we're not making the, we're not cross-linking from the same source URLs or referring domains, excuse me, source domains, referring domains to multiple assets in the same, for the same project, because that does create a footprint. So we have, our, again, the database app that we use keeps track of all of that stuff. So we, and, and guys, 
we're human. We make mistakes occasionally, but it's very rare. Uh, so occasionally, if, if we do ac accidentally use the same referring domain twice and you bring it to our attention, we'll correct it. It has happened. We're human. Um, so and everything that we do is manual and we try to keep very detailed records. But sometimes mistakes are made. And if that if somebody ever finds that and they just bring it to my attention, we will we will replace it. OK, hopefully that's clear. All right. Yeah. So geographic links, we're not going to be able to help you with if it's other countries. It's just it is what it is. Um, but uh, there are we, we can show you how to do it. We've got training for how to go out and hunt down domains with local relevance uh, so that you can build your own as long as you can register the domains, which that's sometimes, you know, again, I, I tell people in Australia, like, sorry, we can't help you with that. We can give you topical relevance, but we can't help you with the geographic relevance. But I, you know, I can point you to the training uh, so that you can learn how to do it on your own and you can train somebody in house or whatever to do it for you. Okay. All right, 15 more minutes. Brad, hey, Bradley, I remember last year you said in, that in order to avoid the cannibalization issue, the way to build lead generation websites going forward is to build a homepage with the company's info, then a service page with the info on the different services the company offers. And then if we were to talk more about a specific service the company offers, talk about it on a page on a separate entity site other than the lead generation website. Does this still hold true today? Or what would you say is the proper way to structure a lead generation website? Thank you so much. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, it's stuff's constantly changing. Um, cannibalization was a significantly bigger problem. Uh, I noticed many months ago, it's, you know, probably, I think sometime around June of last year, it, it, it looks like Google dialed that back a little bit, but what's interesting about it is it's, I don't know that it's actually dialed the cannibalization back as much like the, 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 the problem that that causes as it is that it, let me try to explain what I mean here. So I've been using Cora, Cora light, uh, well, I mean, I have the full Cora, but I only use it for the volatility tester, which um, it was a great is a great tool for de determining if cannibalization is occurring, because Cora will go out and do ten or however many um, successive searches you set, but the default setting is ten. So it's going to go whatever search query you put in. You can geolocate the browser, you can put a search query in, and then assign the domain that it should be looking for a uh, page URL from that domain. And then it goes out and does 10 searches back to back. Again, you can change the settings. You can do more or less if you want, but the default settings are 10 searches back to back. So like literally search, collect the top 100 results, kill it. Search, collect the top 100 results, kill it. It does that 10 times very quickly. And then it shows you the position in what uh, for any of the page URLs that appeared from that domain that you assigned when you set up the, the uh, report or the, the project or whatever, um, and it will show you the pages that have ranked within the top 100 results for that search query and the position at which they ranked each time. So it will show you like, you know, 10, 11, 11, X, you know, whatever. I don't have a report to show you right now. I don't have time to generate one. But if, if it shows X, then, it, it, then that means that it didn't appear for that search query. But if you scroll down, you could see further down that there might be another URL that was potentially competing with that other page and that that all of a sudden popped into the search results, but it might be in position 34, right? And it's because again, Google doesn't know which page it should be serving up for that search query because there's multiple pages on that same domain that are targeting that keyword or a variant of that keyword. And so Google doesn't know. And that Quora tool, the volatility test, SERP volatility tester would show that very clearly. And for months, every time I ran a Quora report on sites for clients and things like that, I would usually find cannibalization issues. And it was very clearly described in those reports. However, sometime around June last year, uh, I noticed that that stopped occurring nearly as much, but I'm still identifying potential cannibalization issue. So I don't know if like, um, I believe cannibalization is still occurring, but it's being treated differently by Google so that the core reports, at least that they don't show it as clearly in, in my opinion. Um, and again, I could be wrong about that, but that's, that's kind of what I've been seeing. So when I was talking about, um, publishing content, what I mean, what I meant by that was a lot of the times clients want to see content published on a regular basis. And for years, that was, my primary method for ranking local business clients was, um, you know, setting up a syndication network, connecting all of it from the RSS feed, and then just and then hammering the syndication network properties with backlinks um, to power them up, and then just publishing content on the blog of the money site regularly because it would distribute or syndicate 
that post out across the syndication network that had just been hammered with backlinks. So we juiced them up and all that kind of stuff. And for years, that's how I got results for clients. I'm not kidding. For many years of my local SEO agency, that is literally all we did. And we got results time and again for all clients for that. Um, sometimes it required more effort than others, but it was the activity of publishing content regularly. But the algorithm shifted. Now the problem with just publishing content for activities purposes or for the sake of charging the client for a, a recurring deliverable, which you know I understand that too, um, but it can cause problems because you have too many too many pieces of content on the site that are targeting a keyword or a variation of that keyword, then that's what causes cannibalization. So what I was talking about was develop the top level pages on the site. And then if you want to do blogging for the sake of blogging, right, the activity type posts, then do that on external branded domain, like ex extensions of the brand, external assets, which means like Blogger, Tumblr, WordPress, Weebly, et cetera. Like you, any one of those, right? Just you can, and or cycling through them. If you have a branded network of profiles of Web 2.0 blogs that are branded and interlinked and all of that, then on one month or, you know, one, one post published on Blogger, one on G Sites, one on Weebly, one on WordPress, one on Tumblr, et cetera. Like I'm not the same post because I don't really syndicate so much anymore, but unique and separate articles on each blog, right? You could cycle through them or you could pick one and that becomes the external blog, whatever. All I'm saying is you would, that way you're not creating cannibalization and competing pages on the same domain. That's all that was, okay? Hopefully that's clear. Um, how would I structure a lead generation website? Well, I, I've taught about this in the mastermind. Um, I just recently finished a whole nother, took me two weeks to build a high level template. Um, but you can go take a look at this just as an example, guys, go look at um, Buckingham. Uh, this is the example site that I built specifically. Um, this one's actually got some uh, components that were stripped down because this is a very rural area. So there's like some of the geo relevance data I couldn't pull for some of these locations just because um, there's not very much data around here. <laughs> I just not, not very many points of interest where I'm at. Um, but this is one that I don't mind sharing as a, kind of a, just an example site. But this is the structure I've talked about many, many times, guys. It's the same one from looking at like the Newberg or Grim Reaper Tree Services site, um, et cetera. It's the same kind of structure. So what we've got here is four different service pages. These are each uh, each page optimized for a separate service. I, it's not the I'm not trying to rank the service pages. The service pages have nothing to do with ranking. Well, they do through internal linking they do, but um, I'm not trying to rank these pages. So we have four separate service pages. The home page is really the brand page and it's optimized for, in this case, a county because all of the locations that we're optimizing for are within this one county. So we optimize the home page for brand plus county, right? So top level topic or category term plus county. Uh, and then we have four separate service pages, which could potentially be combined on the one page um, because these are all very closely related ter uh, services that fall under the tree service category. So they could potentially be combined, but they could also be separated out, which is what I did in this build. Uh, this this structure performs quite well. And then uh, then we've got the service pages. The service pages is what we're trying to rank, not the the not not necessarily the home page and not these service pages. It's the service area pages. Excuse me, the location pages. That's what we're trying to rank. So if you see that. This one, again, I changed the method up a little bit, but why I did, why I've done it this way is because you can see that this one is, is optimized really for city plus tree service. This is really kind of keyword optimization, not category or topic optimization, but there's no Google business profile associated with this. But there's the top level topic term right there, tree maintenance, and it's the H1. And I did that intentionally because I found that uh, this, it, it just, anyway, I don't have time to get into it. We've only got six minutes, but this, this is a really good high performing type of structure for local lead gen. And again, it's about optimizing service pages that don't need to be optimized for any one location. Again, go back and look at, look at this as an example. There's no mention of location in these pages. It doesn't need to be. What we're trying to rank are the location pages. So if you rank, if you optimize the location page for the top level topic or category term, then you can rank each location page for, for each service plus location. Does that make sense? Because again, that's why I've, again, looking at these pages, you'll see that I have the top level topic term as the H1. Because again, I've, I've done some experimenting with this and you can, you can optimize the SEO title or the H, first H1, excuse me, or the H1. There should only be one H1. And the first H2. Um, and, and so if I, I'm putting the top level topic term here, 
And anyway, this site is brand new. I don't think it has any backlinks. None. Uh, I mean, I just had a, I did an ID page, but I don't even think it's indexed yet. And this um, a very low competition area for sure. Not even all the pages on this site are indexed, but it's already ranking on page one for the tree service plus county, uh, tree service plus Grundy, uh, et cetera. So again, just you guys can go take a look at that. Buchanan uh, looks like it should be pronounced Buchanan, but if you say Buchanan around here in this area, the people look at you like you're, well, from, well, Northern Virginia. <laughs> like <laughs> they look at you like you're fucking crazy. So they say Buchanan. Uh, but anyways, you can take a look at that. Why I, I spent two weeks building this structure in high level so that it can be duplicated and deployed very, very quickly uh, because it's a very powerful structure that I've proven over the last two years really performs very well for local search. So this is an example of one of those. Okay. And again, this template is fully available inside the mastermind. And the SOPs, uh, I've just about got those completed for um, how to deploy these sites in high level. And there's also a similar version that I built in WordPress. Um, and that performs really well too. So, and I've got SOPs for that one too. So check it out. All right, guys, I got a few more. I'm going to try to roll through these very, very quickly. Will says, will the treecarehq.com site structure work for a highly competitive local service like a local real estate agency when the SERPs are dominated by Zillow, et cetera? Uh, well, I, I mean, I don't know. Probably, I, remember, you're fighting in the real estate world, guys. That's that's a tough market because you're right. It's dominated by Zillow and uh, Redfin and all those, uh, you know, Weikert and Century 21 and all that shit. It's very difficult, very tough. So will it? Will that structure work? I, I mean, yeah, it will if you can build enough authority to it. Um, and I mean, it, for sure it will. The structure is sound, but in those areas where you're dealing with highly competitive um, URLs that are ranking. And a lot of times you'll check, you'll see, that, like, again, if you do this sort of a link analysis, like what I show here, you'll see that those kind of sites oftentimes have very few external backlinks. They're ranking on the strength of the domain and internal links. And so again, yeah, you can be competitive with that type of structure, but it's going to take a long time. I mean, just a lot of resources to build um, the kind of authority, right? Um, it, it just, with those types of search queries, guys, it's just hard to compete in. It really is. I wish I had a better answer for you. Rob says, how much? How much for what, Rob? Uh, next, Paul Fussell. Do we have to pay for premium on Twitter to be able to post? I don't know. I pay um, to have that blue check mark. So I, I don't know. I don't have, I haven't tried posting. I don't use Twitter for much, guys, but I did pay for that because, uh, just because, um, I can't answer that. I'm not a Twitter user, Paul. I, I, I wish I knew. Maybe somebody else can tell you. I don't know. Sean says, what issues have you faced working with Go High Level and how did you overcome them? Do you sell any snapshots? What if what issues do I face working with Go High Level? Uh, what issues have I not faced working with Go High Level? That would be the, the quicker answer. Uh, <laughs> um, everything. I have a love-hate relationship with high level guys. It I love it when it works, but I hate developing anything in it because it takes for freaking ever um and a lot of trial and error. And um, but you know, out of necessity over the last few years, I've really I feel become fairly proficient with it. Um, so yeah, I I mean just just understand there's a steep learning curve with it and just commit to learning it. And the only there's no short uh there is no substitute for just getting in there and using it regularly and building things with it. And, and it, it's a steep learning curve, but there's, I mean, you can watch all the videos in the world, read all the help docs in the world. It's not going to help until you get in there and just start doing. And as you do, you will learn. Um, and that's, that's the short answer I can give you. Um, there's really, the, that's part of the reason why I'm trying to develop as much of this stuff for our members as possible so that they can just use a high level account and just learn the CRM part so they can focus on marketing and sales and not tech, right? That's part of the reason why so many people that they, they, they get signed up with high level thinking that it's going to help them to make sales and, you know, manage contacts and leads and everything else for their own agencies. And what do they end up doing? They end up spending the next year and a half learning high level instead of marketing and selling, you know? So it's like a rabbit hole. You go down, like you buy this tool to expect that it's going to help you to increase your revenue because it's going to help you to be more efficient and blah, blah, blah. But then for the next 18 months or the next 12 months or the next six months, whatever, you spend all the time trying to learn how to use high level. And it's, so it ends up not being a productivity tool until you become proficient with it, right? It actually can hurt your productivity. 
So I understand it. And that's why I'm trying to produce as much of this stuff for our members as possible so that they can come in and just learn the CRM part for now. Get your cash flow needs met first. Do marketing and selling until you have a certain level of revenue hit that then can support your business and your family. And once you have hit that level, if you then you want to learn how to build automations in high level and add all of this complexity, then do it. But that, so to answer your question, Sean, like I said, you know, when it if you can find snapshots that are already built for your specific needs or very close, yes, buy them because a lot of the work will be done. And then you just have to figure out how, to, how it functions and make sure that you're working within those kind of constraints, so to speak. Um, do I sell any snapshots? Yeah, no, not individual snapshots. But in our mastermind, you can get access to snapshots that I've created, but you have to be a mastermind member. So hopefully that's clear. Um, but the short answer there, again, is just it's very difficult. Just understand there's a big, steep learning curve. There is no substitute for learning how to uh, just build things in there if that's what you're trying to do. If you're just using it for CRM and uh, automation and stuff, if you can find other people that have already created things that are you know, what you need, then that is by far the best way to do it. It's when you have to build custom things in there that it's just it's it's maddening. But by the way, even any automation from a snapshot that you purchase a pre-built automation still needs trial and error, still going to need testing. So it's still very tedious. It's just it's certainly a lot more efficient if you can, uh, you know, just test with pre-built automations than trying to build the automation, too. That's clear. All right, guys, we're over. And I knew that was going to happen today. So do we have any comments that I need to address? Uh, looking through right now, I hop back in. I don't see. Let me start at the bottom, work my way up here. Uh, 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 I think we're good. Yeah, I don't see any questions. Cool. I think we're good. Right on. All right, guys.